it's the next level. You're Elizabeth Lloyd, a Cambridge-educated lawyer sent by James Gascoigne's family to retrieve the body and effects of their recently deceased son. Your mission is to connect with Percival and do whatever it takes to get that list home. And remember, Lorraine, this is highly sensitive. Trust no one. Adrenal Heads, welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. And I'm Wendy. And this week we are covering Atomic Blonde from 2017. And uh, this was Wendy's pick, and it's a great movie, and I'm surprised I have not used this for panels to pixels, because it was based off a trade comic book. <laughs> That's true. You could put it on both. <laughs> we can. Yeah. We can. So... With that, uh, I'll give the brief synopsis that they give us on IMDb based on this particular movie. So, sensual and savage Lorraine Broughton is the most elite spy in MI6, an agent who's willing to use all of her lethal skills to stay alive during an impossible mission. With the Berlin Wall about to fall, she travels into the heart of the city to retrieve a priceless dossier and take down a ruthless espionage ring. Once there, she teams up with an embedded station chief to navigate her way through the deadliest game of spies. Very brief, very subtle, doesn't really give too much away, and I really do enjoy that. <laughs> yes. I love this movie. I'm so glad you picked it. I mean, we, I asked you, you to do it, it but yeah. <laughs> so glad you let me do it. No problem. Yeah, I, it's one of those that I forgot was based on a trade paperback, which is uh, pretty cool. And you would not think based upon everything that was going on within yeah. the movie, too, because it's so adult-themed. Yep. And, yeah. And obviously, Charlize Theron was very much the producer in this movie. She was advocating for a lot of it. Uh, you'll probably have more information with that we'll go into later. But... We're just going to talk about the people we know within the film, and I'm just doing brief versions, and we're only giving uh, a few people that we would commonly know in movies. So first off would be Charlize Theron herself, and you may have seen her in movies like Children of the Corn, Urban Harvest. And that Never was her, seen that. <laughs> it was her first film in 1995, and one that I love because I'm a huge kaiju fan. Mighty Joe Young from 1998, and that was a Disney movie. After that, Reindeer Games in 2000, that was with Ben Affleck and I liked that Gary one. Gary Sinise, and that, that was a really good movie. Very different, very strange. Uh, Monster, which she got an Academy Award for, playing a uh, serial killer. Yep. Female serial, serial killer, and uh, she actually changed her body for that, and she does that she in did. a lot of films. I yeah. think she actually did that for Atomic Blonde as well. So, very creative, very good. The next one up, The Italian Job, which I love, too, as well, with yep. Edward Norton, uh, Marky Mark Wahlberg, and <laughs> a slew of other Seth Green, a whole bunch of people that I love from 2003. Another one, Mad Max Fury Road. From 2015, and uh, she plays Furiosa in that, and I really enjoyed that film. Ben would state that it's not a Mad Max movie. It could have been just Fury Road, and I do agree with that because, you know, it it's not a Mad Max film, in my opinion, unless it's got Mel Gibson in it. <laughs> well, she stole the show in that in that. Uh, and they're going to be doing a Furiosa movie, too, which is right. really cool. So we've got Anya tell a joy that's going to be playing Furiosa too. So I, I look forward to that. She also did Prometheus and she, I, didn't she do Cider House Rules? Yes, she did. Cider House Rules. I really liked her in that. That was an early film for her and she did Snow White and the Huntsman and she played the Wicked Queen and she was amazing. Yes. Yeah. And and the astronaut's wife with Johnny oh. Depp. <gasps> Oh, yes. <laughs> I haven't thought about that in forever. Yeah, I just yeah, I that love that movie. Pocket. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next one up. 
James McAvoy, who played in Band of Brothers. I recently rewatched that. Yep. Wanted 2008, uh, the X-Men series as Professor X. And he was amazing in that. I love him in that. He also yeah. played Splinter, the M. Night Shyamalan, Shyamalan movie. Was that? Um, yes. Yes, he did. Splinter, I think it was. Yes, called. it was. It yeah, was. Uh, he was really good in that. He's been in Filth. If you ever ever seen Filth. I've seen it. That's I a crazy, seen a long time. crazy movie that he's just, he's worth it. <laughs> yeah. He, he's a very different actor and I like yeah. everything that he does because he's very creative. Because mm -hmm. if you look at Band of Brothers, he only played one character in that and he was only there for like maybe three episodes for that season. Yeah. And then Wanted was his big outcoming where he was able to do something. An early movie he did was Wimbledon yes. with uh, Kirsten Dunst. Yep. And who is the actor? He plays um, Vision. Vision. <laughs> I can't remember his name, the actor, but I love him. That movie was really good. He played the brother and he just had some of the funniest scenes, a, a kind of a smaller part, but he was really great in it. He's very good with comedic lines, mm -hmm. too, in any film. And he actually proves that within this particular film, too, if you yes. think about it. So he's very comedic, even though it's not really a comedic film. But yep. we, we get that out of him, so he has those chops. And, and you needed forward. that. He was yeah, a good do. counterbalance to her character, who, yes, who plays is. it very cool and serious. That he does, but then, you yeah. know, the, the quips that they have within the film is really yeah. cool. Next up would be John Goodman, and we all know who John Goodman is. You know, we remember him as the coach from Revenge of the Nerds in 1984. He was in Chud in 1984 so, as well. That's a while well. ago. That's, it's, uh, you know, cannibalistic humanoid underground dwellers. That's what the name of that movie is. Uh, and he was there with Daniel Stern, and uh, it was an old B horror movie that I enjoy. Raising Arizona. In That's 1987, hilarious. a Nick Cage yeah. movie with Holly Hunter. Yep. He plays one of the the guys that he uh, Nick Cage was imprisoned with, and they mm -hmm. break out, and they do everything. Always, in 1989, with Richard Dreyfuss and also Holly Hunter, and something that I do appreciate as a love story movie. Yep. Yep. There were pilots, and they put out fires. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, pretty cool. Blues Brothers 2000 in 1998. And that was him trying to uh, cover up for uh, John Belushi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. But you got James Belushi in there, too, so that you had four people in it. And I think Macaulay Culkin was in there as well. Wow. Yeah. Oh, Brother, Where Art Thou? In 2000. That was a pretty good movie. I like yep. that. It's got George Clooney in it. Monsters, Inc. Who doesn't love Sully in 2001? Right. And now you could hear John Goodman's voice on Disney+. Plus. That's really cool. And he, they're doing the new Monsters, Inc. kind of show on Disney+. Plus. So check that out, all you panelers or adrenaline heads out there. Red State, which is a Kevin Smith movie, which I love. And he plays the typical sheriff or cop in that in 2011. And very intense movie for Kevin Smith. So it's not a comedy. It's very intense and pretty much a commentary and Kevin Smith got some flack on us, but John Goodman was really good within I haven't seen that. Yeah, I highly recommend it. And, of course, his role as Dan Connor on Roseanne throughout the 80s and yep. early 90s. And then into the Connors yep. in, in the Millennium. So, we got that. He also played in a movie with Kevin Bacon called Death Sentence. Yes. And it was really dark, uh, but his role was really good. He played a bad guy in that. He, he was pretty good. He does play bad guys very well. Mm -hmm. um, what was it? Um, I forget the name. Cloverfield Place. Yes. Yeah. Was Ten Cloverfield Lane. Ten Cloverfield Lane. Yep. There you go. Okay. Yeah. You would think I would remember that because I'm Yeah, that he was good in that too. Yeah. <laughs> he was really good. He, uh, But he had a lot of weight on at that time. He's lost a lot of weight since then too, by the yeah. way. So he yeah, looks he, very good. He now. looks pretty good. Yeah. He's doing all those uh, lotto style commercials now that you see that you, mm -hmm. you buy a scratch off. <laughs> yeah. All right. Next up. Toby Jones of Finding Neverland, The Mist, 
There's one. Yes. Your Highness, Captain America, the first Avenger, and the upcoming show, What If? Yep. And on the Disney Plus series, he reprises his role as Dr. Armin Zola from Captain America. Yep. Yeah, we all remember him. Yep. He always pleased these kind of Weasley kind of things, but he was pretty good in Doctor Who as well. So if you are Doctor Who fans out there, I, I'm sure you're all happy to see yep. his face and his voice. Next up would be Sophia Butella, and you could find her in The Kingsman in 2014, The Mummy 2017, and Star Trek Beyond in 2016. Hmm. She was great in this. Yes. Bill Skarsgård played Allegiant in 2016, It in 2017. I don't know if I'll be able to see him as anything else. And Deadpool 2 in 2018. Yeah, it was a character part that he did mm-hmm. in Deadpool 2. They, um, it was the X Factor group, and he was part of that, and he dies. So, <laughs> sorry, spoilers. He dies. That's okay. <laughs> but it's funny. But he's a Scars guard, so you got to love him. All right, well, with that... We'll just move right along into our general thoughts of the movie. So, Wendy, what do you got? Well, I received my undergrad degree in political science, and I graduated in December of 1989. I was really interested in international politics. And in 1989, the Soviet Union just kind of blew up from the inside out. (laughs) And the culmination of that was the fall of the Berlin Wall that happened in November 1989 while I was a senior getting ready to graduate. Atomic Blonde takes place in the days surrounding those events. And Mm. so this movie was really just endlessly fascinating to me. Um, It's an adaptation of the graphic novel, The Coldest City. Mm -hmm. And when I read up on this, um, it said that Charlize Theron actually um, came across this graphic novel before it was even published. And she became obsessed with making a movie out of this. And I, um, I have not read the graphic novel, but I have read that it's very different from the movie. Um, And I think the novel is much more stoic and serious. Mm. And the movie um, is certainly more action and more stylized. And I think that plays really well. I think I just think it's really fascinating that Charlize plays kind of a triple agent spy. No spoilers. (laughs) Right. (laughs) She's she's posing as an MI6 agent. Mm -hmm. But the KGB thinks that she's in their pocket. Yeah. And all the while, she's actually working for the CIA. Yeah. So um, at the so very end, we do find that out. Yeah. yeah. I just thought that was really fascinating and um, really cool. I just love this movie. A very interesting movie, nonetheless. And I'm so glad that you picked it. And the fact that I forgot that it was based on a trade. Yeah. The fact that Charlize actually wanted to do this before it was put into trade, that means mm-hmm. it was in comic form, meaning right. that she was reading comics. So yep. how cool is that? Yeah. He probably has those comics boarded yeah. and bagged somewhere. Who she's knows? got a lot of foresight. Like she's a creator. I'm, I'm really, I'm really anxious. Like I, I wait to see what she comes up with next. So a few panelers or adrenalides are really into it. Go out, get, if you can find the trade, I'm pretty sure you can find it online through Comixology um, online. And you could get through that, your iPad or uh, Google style tablet that's out there or an Android tablet. Or even your phone. But I don't like to read comics on my phone. I usually do it on my iPad. But you could probably find it and get it through uh, Comicsology. And then do that. The book, like as Wendy had stated, is going to be a little bit different than the movie itself. But that's how these movies are adapted from. They were basically just to give us more action, more feel. But I believe the drama... And everything else is pretty much very similar in the same, the espionage that's involved within yes. the, the comic. So that that's what's really cool about this particular movie. And that's what really captivated me. And when you brought this up, I'm like, I remember watching it. And it, I think I watched it twice before and I've had it. But I just never really went back to it. And then when she brought it up, I'm like, I have to watch this a couple of times because this is all over the place. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it is. Yeah. All right. So uh, with that, we're just going to move right into our uh, favorite scenes or uh, favorite thoughts of the movie itself. So do you have favorite scene yeah, or thought? Yeah, 
I think my favorite scene in the entire movie is the one that starts with Lorraine attempting to get spyglass and his family across the border. Hmm. The tension's really thick. They use the East German rebels. Um, They all pull up black umbrellas so no one can see them as they're marching down the street with the protesters. I thought that was just really cool. Everything looks really cool in this movie. Yeah, the way they filmed it. And um, it just leads to this amazing fight scene, probably one of the most badass fight scenes ever. Charlize is spectacular. I love seeing women in these badass fight scenes. Having the scene on a set of what looks like concrete or marble stairs is really genius. It had to be really hard to film. (laughs) Um, And finally, a very wounded spyglass. You also see this older gentleman who's obviously being protected, but he's also fighting for his life. Mm. I just I just watched the scene before um, later uh, earlier this evening, and I can't imagine all that went into making this the scene. The action and the tension continues. It feels like one long continuous shot. Uh, they they steal a police officer's car, and then the scene immediately turns into this amazing car chase. Uh, some of the visuals in that are amazing where she's like revving it going backwards and you're seeing all the cars just kind of going around them. Uh, made all the better by the realistic backdrop of the East Germans protesting in the background. And just when you think the scene is slowing down, they kind of pull it off to the side. They're hit by a car and the car run uh, falls over the side into the canal and goes underwater and that scene is almost 15 minutes long it's really spectacular oh yeah yeah i i Mm -hmm. completely agree with that that to me is an amazing scene and i just love the idea um i'm trying to remember who played the character of spyglass because we do remember him and he was in. I didn't the, write his name down. I wrote a couple of others, but yeah, yeah. but he, he was, was in, good. Yeah, he's a he's a British actor, and mm-hmm. he was in The World's End, which hmm. uh, actually Ben had just covered not too long ago with uh, Paik when they were talking about uh, Edgar Wright, hmm. and he plays one of the friends in the fold, and I hmm. thought that was pretty cool, and that's the first thing I thought of. So, but I'm pretty sure Ben's screaming at his. Uh, Headphones right now going, you can't remember the actor. <laughs> but yeah. But at he least was great. I, I remembered it. <laughs> That's the cool part. But uh yeah, the the one thing that captivated about me with this movie is the music. I really oh, yes. do enjoy the music. It's got a great soundtrack. It's very much from the time that it came out, but also not only do we get the original versions, but we do get the German or French versions of these songs within it. The only drawback for me, Marilyn Manson was never around at that time. Right. So it was the one song that really took me out of the movie when really? that scene came up. Yeah. That they was the used a few issue. covers too, like modern covers of they did, 80 songs. But yeah. at least some of the songs mm-hmm. were with them proper. That was like an original style mm-hmm. song, in my opinion. And it really took me away from the movie. Mm-hmm. At least if you did something that was a cover from within that era, right. it works. It sounds the, pretty similar, yeah. They're authentic. They did 99 Luff Balloons a lot. <laughs> That's so good, yeah. Uh, they did Till Tuesdays, Voices Carry. Yep. They played at least like two or three times within mm-hmm. the movie. And uh, th- there was a couple other mo- songs that just captivated me because I remember the 80s. You and I both remember the 80s. Yep. So. We remember those songs because it's in yeah. our heart and we know it. And we could tell you who wrote the song and, you know, the name of the band right off the top of our heads. Maybe not give you the exact year it came out, but at least mm-hmm. we'll give it to you, you know? Yeah, I, I think their use of the music was really well. It, it was well very done. relevant to the time, especially because it was 1989. And at that time, it was a, a dawning of changing of decades, too. And the fall of the Berlin Wall Mm -hmm. as well. And I I love how they had that little thing that's cliched in the very beginning. It's like, well, this is not about that. (laughs) And then they go (laughs) into the story. Right, (laughs) right. A lot of things happened in 1989, and this was a big, huge one. But we're not talking about that. That's right. (laughs) I like that. But it's it's really a cool event to have this backdrop. It's so, like, European-looking and... 
Yeah. It, it was great. Uh, do you have another one? I have lots. Let's see. The scene where Percival kills Delphine. Oh. Um, very tragic, but also a great scene. It's kind of another battle to the death. You aren't really sure who's going to come out ahead of that until the end. Correct, yeah. It was amazing. Like, there's so many great The knife in the scenes. back. He I had a hard know. time getting that knife out of that back. I don't think he ever did get it out, did he? And we didn't, he we didn't see it. He backed into that wall and he kind of jaggered yeah. it more in and yeah. caused more pain. I'm glad that McAvoy actually pushed <laughs> that through. <laughs> yeah, I think he walked out with it still in him. <laughs> yeah, I think so, too. The scene where David Percival breaks into Lorraine's room in the beginning of the movie and Lorraine attacks him. He's smoking a cigarette and he never takes the cigarette out of his mouth the whole time. She's like strangling him. He's still smoking. Yep. <laughs> and then she winds up taking it out and putting it yes, out too yes. after they have a nice little conversation. Yeah, just so cool. <laughs> um, I thought the sex scene between Delphine and Lorraine was great, tender Oof. and lots of action all at once. I liked the relationship that they had, and I thought it fitted in really well with this highly stylized movie. Yeah, I uh, that scene, you know, that, that would be a guy's dream. Or but a girl's the, dream. Or a girl's dream, too. <laughs> I, I can't, you know, I or anybody in between. Who knows? Yeah. But the thing is, is that to me, I enjoyed it, but it's like, that's a little bit too long for me. It's kind of like, okay, it should be fast, like within Terminator when Linda Hamilton and... Yeah, yeah. You know, they just show a, a, a silhouette of two people, and then, like and then that thing, and then it, it's a and silhouette, then it just cuts to and after. It just cuts, and that <laughs> should be fine. But I, oh, I no, guess I thought these, this was great. I guess Charlize, as we know, and she's been nude throughout the whole movie, she's yep. okay and comfortable with her body enough right. to do that. Yep. You got it, girl. You got it. You you know she you sure does. <laughs> she's amazing, and yep. And she's not a young woman anymore, but yet she is still... She looks still, amazing. She yeah. still looks amazing. She's a model. She does everything with perfume. Yeah. Uh, give her kudos to that. Um, but, you know, to me, I was just like, okay, got yep. it. Yep. She sells <laughs> Jetador. Not that I'm... Not that this is sponsored by them, but it's no. good. <laughs> no, but it, yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, no, so, I know it is. Yeah, I... Well, I don't smell perfume all that yeah <laughs> the gun battle scene towards the end of the movie with lorraine versus the kgb mm. this is a great scene the feathers were flying everywhere the colors just really well done i loved that until the very end you aren't completely sure who is really satchel yep. when the movie appears to end but then we see lorraine move into another scene with the kgb and with um uh, Brem, Brem, Bremovich, Brem, Bremovich. Um, you you start to think, well, maybe we've had it all wrong, and Lorraine actually is Satchel. I really like that you didn't know it till the end. Um, I thought that was really cool. And this isn't really a scene, but I just um, when I looked online, I saw that it got some criticism online, and a lot of people thought it was confusing. And I thought about that. There are a lot of twists and turns, and it really keeps you guessing. But I think this is one of those movies that it gets better on the second watch and even better on the third watch because there's so many little details. I think that's what got me watching it multiple times was there's so many little details that I think it, it does really well on multiple watches. Awesome. That's it for me. That's it for you? That's it? Yep. <laughs> uh, well... The first scene that we do get to see her in is that ice bath scene in the very beginning. And it always gave me chills. Yeah. And the reason why is you could see the woman is in pain. I mean, she's she been has bruises all over bruises her Bruises all over her. Yeah, she's nude. Yeah. Whatever. I don't care. Yeah. But I'm sorry. She had to take an ice bath and yeah. then down some vodka at that point, too, before her interrogation or the recap of what the events happened on her mission. And that's literally what it was. It was very much similar to an interrogation for her of what of the events that have happened between the CIA and MI6. And that's where we start off. And a lot of the movie, which I like, is about is these are her recaps. And then what we find out at the very end. Yeah. It's kind of like the usual suspects at certain points. Mm -hmm. 
I saw a few people criticizing that format, but I just thought it worked so well in this. Yeah. I, I think it would have been a different movie had it been a, you know, start to finish chronological order. I I, I just think it works so well. Well, it was pretty much a start to finish with her starting. Right. But it starts the at the end. You it know? starts at the end yeah. with the interview. Yeah. But then moves into the mission and yeah. her I, I describing this the situation. So uh, another scene that I really enjoyed was our introduction to Percival and how Lorraine and him interact. <laughs> and he's a bit feral, as they state, at MI6 and how he is. Because yep. he, he's – and it's so funny because he's so engrossed within the lore of everything that's going on in Germany at the time. So he's yes. got German MTV in the background. He's got all these other artifacts – He's got a Hustler magazine. So he goes, he's got cases of jeans of Levi's yeah, in his apartment. Yeah, he's selling all these things on the black market because he yeah. knows. And that and that's he, he literally enwrapped himself in everything that was going on within Germany. He's got a cast on his arm. He's <laughs> doing a three-way with his hand tied to something. Like he's just so bizarre he is a bizarre person yeah. but unfortunately we lose him in the end yeah <laughs> uh but you know the um i just love this one scene too father figure is playing as she's being attacked within the apartment trying to obtain clues from james at that point and she sees the picture of percival and james and then she has to take out all the russians and then at the very end when she leaves out the window Yep. She winds up taking out the German <laughs> police right. officers. And I think she's like, for fuck's sake. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That 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 was a quote, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh I, I just love the uh the look of Germany at that time. While mm -hmm. it was in the middle of its transition, because we get to see that uh with all the graffiti, you get to see all the punkers and everything on the street. Yep. And everything is kind of digressing at that point. People don't know what to do. Right. So Germany is at, at, and then it, like kind of enthralled at that point. And yep. it, with the music and the vibes that came into what was going on within the movie kind of gave me that American Psycho kind of feel too. Because if you remember the movie with Ameri uh, American Psycho, they did use 80s themed songs mm -hmm. that represented that particular era. And... I really enjoyed that movie as well. It's it's very underrated. A lot of people hate it. The sequel is terrible, but the the original American Psycho is based upon a book that yep. I have read a bunch of times. And you know, if you know, if you're the fan of art, please don't read it or don't watch the movie itself. But, it's from the same author that did Less Than Zero, right? Yes. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think my daughter has read it. I don't think I've read it, but I was a fan of the movie. I don't usually want to go back and watch it because it's dark, but it is dark. I, I thought it was very well done. And you're I always not exactly used, sure yeah. at the end of the movie of what happened. Yeah. What really it was everything in his head or did this right. really happen? Yep. And that's it. We kind of get to that same kind of mm -hmm. point at the very end. We don't know what. But then we get the ending scene. Right. If they left it off very casual, they could have done anything they wanted. Yep. Which would have been interesting. But yep. they are in the works of doing an, an Atomic Blonde 2. And it's in production and they plan on... I, I think they settled with Netflix to do it as a Netflix movie. Yeah, I think the pandemic had something to do with that because it's it was hard. It. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But I will still be there. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. And I'll if if it's being played too on Netflix, yep. I'll be watching it as well. One other Percival killing the Russian that killed James. So he really took it personally. So you could see he wanted vengeance. So I really admired that and enjoyed that because you could tell that was his friend. So it was definitely a personal thing. Mm -hmm. Plus, he needed that list that was stolen from for the mission. Right. So and obviously we. And then I think he uses an ice pick, or was it a screwdriver? I forget. I think it was. He said it was an ice pick to the head. Nice. Yeah. No. And that was unexpected. It just came out of nowhere. You didn't expect that. That was yeah. cool. Yep. Yeah, and that adds to the twists and turns mm -hmm. within the movie that are amazing because you don't really know who Satchel is till the very end. And you right. mentioned this before. You think during the movie that it's Percival, Lorraine, 
Um, everybody is suspect. Self, everybody is suspect. Yeah. Everybody's sus, yep. as they say in Among <laughs> Us. Yeah. But Spyglass was always a, a suspect in himself, too. But then, obviously, you know, she gets him out or tries to get him and his family out. But all the scenes being all from the point of view at times, they say it makes it hard to, f- you know, I think it it's hard to figure out at times. Mm-hmm. If you're a first time viewer, uh, if you've watched it so many yes. times, obviously, you know, the outcome. Yes. You know. Yeah. I think that's why probably on first view, it's it's got a lot going on in the movie. But oh, yeah. I think it, it does really well on second and third watch. I loved the action choreography within this movie because it was very it was done very well it it was very well done and there are certain movies that are done like we could talk about the taken movies yeah liam neeson's not a a spring chicken anymore yep so but with with shirley she really put her all in it and you could tell a lot of those action stunts she had done herself can't imagine how long it took to film some of those scenes. They're really well done. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's pretty much our thoughts on Atomic Blonde from 2017. So now we're going to move right along into interesting facts and unknown facts about the movie Atomic Blonde. So I'll start off. Okay. So the, uh, the movie is directed by David Leach. And his first solo directorial credit, and it's written by Kurt Johnstad. Uh, I saw David Leach also did John Wick. Yes. And I think he did some others that I know. I can't remember now what they are. Um, The movie's cast includes Charlize Theron, James McAvoy, John Goodman, Till Schweiger, Eddie Marzan, Sophia Boutella, and Toby Jones. Mm Mm-hmm. And Charlize Theron had eight personal trainers to help her master her intensely physical performance. So that's pretty cool. She also trained with Keanu Reeves, who is prepping for John Wick Chapter 2. That's really cool. Charlize cracked two teeth while filming. She injures herself a lot. When she was doing Snow White, she, like, burst her vocal cords by screaming so loud. Oh, wow. Yeah, she's an all-in. You She's an tell. all-in kind of gal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. At least she puts all her effort into her film, so you have to appreciate that. Yes. So before filming resumed, McAvoy broke his hand on the set of Split and had to endure all his action stunts and scenes with an injured hand. And it's funny, <laughs> I guess it really that's worked. what the, the cast the was cast. for. And it, and it really did work just to make him this bizarre character. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Charlize Theron spent five years developing Atomic Blonde. Awesome. Uh, The pivotal fight on the marble stairs presented one of the most challenging sequences in the film. So Charlize Theron was actually slammed against a padded wall, but her tumble down the stairs, which were also padded to look like marble, was executed by Canadian stuntwoman Monique Ganderton. Nice. Pretty cool. Charlize Theron said that the success of Mad Max Fury Road helped guide the development of Atomic Blonde. I believe that. I believe after that movie, they probably said, okay, whatever you like. Exactly, because she was very much a focal point within that movie. It's something I highly recommend. It took 45 minutes to film Charlize Theron's sex scene with Sophia Batella. Theron found that the, the scene easy and attributed it this to the fact to them both being dancers. Yeah, I read a little bit about that. They said, like, with mm. dancers, like, being naked is no big deal. Like, so. Yeah, they, that works. They, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Carl F. Butcherer's watch is featured prominently in the movie. The director, David Leach, is a brand ambassador for the watch company. The watch brand is also worn by the title character in John Wick, yes. a movie that was co-directed by Leach. Yes, and we covered John Wick and John Wick Chapter 2 already. So check those podcasts out. So Kat and I covered those. We talked furthermore about David Leach as well within those films. So early early part of the movie where Shirley Stone is in a car and tried to beat the two escorts, the tunnel sequence in Berlin was the same tunnel used in Captain America Civil War. The part where Black Panther chases down Bucky Barnes 
And it's also the same tunnel used in the hum- Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2, when Katniss Everdeen and her team try to get to President Snow. So oh. interesting. Before the final fight, a Russian song is playing Capricious Horses by Vladimir Vysotsky with the word, no one is late for their meeting with God. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool. When a credit score being uh, begins, the words password is displayed and the coldest city is entered. The movie was previous call, previously called The Coldest City. Nice. So, yeah, I think that had to do with the uh, the trade paperback as mm-hmm. well. The Wilhelm screen, a stock sound effect, is used during the apartment fight as Lorraine is jumping out of the window. I heard that. <laughs> I, I don't think that. I did. <laughs> I did. I, I As soon as I heard it, I thought of Ben right away. So in both uh, Atomic Blonde and Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, Toby Jones plays a senior British intelligence officer in the Cold War. And most of his screen time is spent seated at a table in a soundproof briefing <laughs> room. <laughs> yeah. And to, the, yeah, that's Toby Jones that we all know. He's kind of. Yeah. Yeah. It was originally hoped that David Bowie would play a part in the movie, although he turned down the offer shortly before his death. Aw. Yeah. Would have been nice to see him. Oh, yeah. The entire movie is shot on locations throughout Europe. Atomic Blonde is the second movie to feature Till Schweiger and play the song Cat People by David Bowie. The first was Inglorious Bastards. Both movies play cat people while a woman looks in the mirror and applies makeup. Both movies are about fictional military plots circling around actual historical events. I think that's what I think of when I hear that song. I think of both of those movies. That is a scene in Inglorious Bastards where it's used is excellent as well. And it's funny, too, because Till Schweiger is always represented in films as playing Germans, Mm -hmm. if you think about it, too. Mm -hmm. Although set in 1989, the only pre-existing song on the soundtrack that was released that year is Fight the Power by Public Enemy. All the other songs were released before that year. Well, that's kind of a lie. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. They use some covers and stuff. They use covers. But I think they said, like... The early 80s was more of the sound they were looking for yeah. as opposed to it. You know, by 1989, we were doing like Love Shack and things like that. Yeah, so that not, is true. Right into yeah, the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. Atomic Blonde is Sophia Butella's second time in a spy movie. Her first time was in Kingsman, the Secret Service. Yes. Broughton is shown upon arriving in Berlin with her rolling luggage. Though very rare at the time, rolling luggage is not in an anarchistic here as it was invented in the 1970s. Yeah, hmm. um, w- one thing I wanted... Anachronist. Yeah. Uh, anachronistic? Oh, okay. Anachronistic. Okay. One thing I wanted to bring up is I went down a rabbit hole, not not recently, but like a year ago about this movie, and I stumbled onto this website, and there's several articles about it as well, about the costumes in this movie they're so authentically done like a lot of it isn't vintage things but it's based on things that really existed back then and i think they did such a really good job i don't know if anybody's interested in costumes but i really like that kind of stuff and um if you look up there's multiple articles about the um costumes and the apparel used in the movie and i remember that was one of them they said they really tried to make her look like she was styled a bit above for the day, but still authentic to the, to the time period. And I think, I think it looks pays super tribute cool. to it. Yeah. And it works within yeah. the, uh, the era that it's in. I really do appreciate that. That's really yeah. cool. Next up, Eddie Marzan previously worked with Charlie Theron in Hancock, as well as Snow White and the Huntsman. Hancock is one. I didn't yeah, think about yeah. She's great in that too. Yeah. She plays the superhero. Yep. <laughs> Tetris is on the screen of the microcomputer in the foreground of the screen where they are gi- giving Spyglass a new identity. <laughs> Tetris. Tetris. Remember that? Yep. Yeah. That was a rushing game, too, by the way. So. Huh. Yeah. That's right. Towards the end of the movie, Merkel poses as a Swede. Bill Skarsgård is actually Swedish and uses his native accent in that scene. Nice. Awesome. 
Broughton's character is seen throughout the movie drinking Stoli on Ice, which is a Russian vodka. Mm -hmm. This reinforces the idea that she is the Russian double agent until the final reveal. Ah. And next up, an MTV voiceover mentions the newest music controversy over sampling near the end when Broughton walks to the plane. The song playing is under pressure. Yeah. <laughs> A Queen and David Bowie song that in 1990 has its bass line sampled by Vanilla Ice in Ice Ice Baby, an accusation that he initially denied. But obviously it was. <laughs> it was. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I remember that clearly, too. I remember yep. that. Yeah. When meeting Delphine in her friend's bar, she orders Lorraine her specialty drink, Stoli on Ice, which, <laughs> in which Lorraine replies, you pay attention. And then Delphine says, I look for pleasure in the details. However, she seems to miss that Lorraine drops her British accent and resumes her American accent. <laughs> ah, I miss that, too. I miss that, too, completely. Yeah. All and then right. I just had a couple other things. I think we already talked about the soundtrack. Sure. Um, this, the I, I read online that the sequel to the film, oh, you said that, um, Charlize is slated to be the producer. Mm -hmm. But I also saw that uh, the um, producer, Leach, has also discussed a crossover film featuring the Atomic Blonde and John Wick worlds. And, like, <laughs> sign me up for that. I'm, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah, if they have... Uh... Loughton, or what, what's her name? Broughton. Lorraine. Lorraine yeah. Broughton. Yeah, if they have Lorraine Broughton at the uh, Continental, that'd be interesting. Yeah. Um, or that or, she has a nameplate there or something. Yeah. That would be or, cool. Or maybe when John was younger. I don't know. I don't know how that would go. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was a small detail, but I thought that the spray painted text in the movie was really cool and kept with the 80s feel of it. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Yeah, like it that. gave that anarchistic kind of look because mm -hmm. it's Atomic Blonde. And if you think Atomic, you think of, at that time, all the spray paint that was going on. And usually it's like neon colors. Yep, at I that liked point. it. It was hot pink or green at, at certain points. Yeah. So I enjoyed that, too. Yep. By the way, I think you made Kat just squeal because you talked about a combination of Atomic Blonde and John Wick, right? Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty excited for that, so. Same here. That would be great if they do that. Yeah. All right. Well, on to quotes. So, Wendy, do you have any quotes? Uh, let's see. One of the attack attackers in the long scene that I talked that I love so much says, take this, you bitch, as he is strangling Lorraine, and then Lorraine stabs him in the eye and says, I think she says, am I your bitch now or who's your bitch now or something like that. I thought that was pretty funny. I thought it was you're my bitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, one of my quotes is an exchange between Lorraine and Percival. And Lorraine goes, I've read your file. I also read your dog file. So let's cut the crap, shall we? The whole hungover, show up late, don't know which way is up, act, I'm not buying it. I trust you about as far as I can throw you. And Percival says, it's a double pleasure to deceive the deceiver. And Lorraine says, Niccolo Machiavelli, it was on your shelf. And Percival <laughs> says, oh my God, I think I love fucking love you. And, <laughs> and then Lorraine's like, that's too bad. Yep. <laughs> that's yeah. as they're walking down yep. the main road. Yeah, I liked that that quote as well. That was really good. Uh, a little funny one I thought was Lorraine and Spyglass that make their way out of the building and they're confronted by a police officer. Lorraine threatens the police officer in German and takes his car. Yep. And once in the car, Spyglass says to Lorraine, you need to work on your German. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, another one from a Lorraine, as per usual. You got some balls breaking in here. And David Percival says, you should see my balls. Then you'd yeah. really be impressed. <laughs> yeah, I remember that one too. <laughs> he is just chock full of quotes. Yeah, he's, he is. he's great. I like he says, you can't unfuck what's been fucked. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And then he says, truth and lies, people like us don't know the difference. And then finally, at the end, Lorraine says to him, you went to the KGB to take me out. You were too fucking scared to do it yourself. And David says, too smart, more like. And he's right. Like, I was scared of you because 
you're going to kill me. So I thought that was really funny. Well, my last one would be from Lorraine herself saying, and this is, I think this is during the interrogation or the recap of her mission. And she goes, you know, those movies where the picture just starts to slow down and melt, then catch fire. Well, that's Berlin. Yeah, that was cool. I liked that. David at the very end says, so what have I learned after all this time, after all those sleepless nights, lying to friends, lovers, myself, playing this crooked game in this crooked down town filled with backstabbers and four-faced liars? I'll tell you what I've learned, one thing and one thing only. I fucking love Berlin. And I thought that was great. (laughs) He's kind of revealing a little bit there when he's saying how he was lying to everybody. Yeah. And then my final one is Lorraine to the KGB head, uh, Br- Bramovich. Br- Bramovich. Mm-hmm. Uh, she says, I never worked for you. You worked for me. Every false intel I gave you, a rip in the iron curtain, every piece of intel you gave me, a bullet in my gun. I want my life back. And she says all of that while he's dying because she shot him in the throat. <laughs> and she's pouring herself a glass of vodka and ice. Yeah. <laughs> And then the scene, that scene immediately breaks into Under Pressure by Queen. And I yes, just thought it, it couldn't be more fitting. It does. It's very fitting. Yep. All right. Well, that was uh, pretty much our coverage of yeah. Atomic Blonde from 2017. Well, right now we're just going to move right along into what I like to call guilty pleasure movies. And those could be any movie that you enjoy that you love. It might have gotten a bad IMDb rating. It might be something that when you're in a bunch of a group of your friends and some you say it and they all go, that movie sucked. <laughs> and you're stuck there going, oh, crap, I'm the only one that loves this movie. But you try to defend it, but nobody likes to do that, want to hear it. Uh, but then, you know, it, these are just the movies that you love. And it could be bad. It could be great. Or it could be just one that people just don't have on their radar but you just love it for yourself and it it's your own little guilty pleasure so uh what do you have well daphne and paik recently covered lake placid on run for your lives podcast and i had forgotten how much i liked that movie it's an (laughs) action movie about a giant crocodile living in a freshwater lake in maine and when i say giant i mean you know like 10 times bigger than any other crocodile has ever been yeah But it's really a campy comedy as well. And I just forgot how much I like that. It's really cute. Yeah, I listened to that podcast on the Pyrocore Entertainment Network, too. And Mm -hmm. I love their coverage on it. And actually, it's pretty funny. As they released it that week, I actually had a message out to Meredith Salinger because she brought up a practical effect. So I try to link the podcast to her tweet so that way she could listen to it yeah but yeah she was in that movie as well she was a uh uh not a prominent character in it but she played a a sheriff within it and she was really good as well Uh, i forget the uh was she the sheriff who hooks up with the who's trying to hook the bohemian guy yes Yeah. yeah 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 i remember her character real well yeah yeah, she was a child actress. She was uh, Natty Gan. She's yeah. been in that was a great, Dream a that Little was, Dream. She was good yeah. in that. Yeah, she was really good in that. Mm-hmm. And I really do recommend that. Actually, when um, I didn't realize, it's like, oh, do I have this movie? And I didn't have it, so I downloaded it on on iTunes from my Apple TV, and I watched it. Even though I didn't even get a chance to send in feedback, but I just had to watch it because. It's one of those movies you got to watch because it's, it's one of my oldest daughter's favorite. She loves like Jaws and she yeah. loved, loved Lake Placid. Yeah, it's it kind of falls into that category. That organic kaiju mm-hmm. movie where it's like a, a big, you know, shark or Meg or mm-hmm. alligator crocodile. Remember alligator in the 70s yes. that played on TV? <laughs> yeah. So things of that nature. It's like, oh, don't flush your alligator down the <laughs> toilet. It might come back and get you. I think we were all terrified of that for a couple of years. Yeah, I think so, too. All right. Well, mine, that would be Cutthroat Island from 2005, and that's with Gina Davis and Matthew Modine. So it's not one that's heralded and highly at all. It doesn't really have a great score on Rotten Tomatoes or R on IMDb at that. But I do enjoy it for the fact, well, you yeah, know, come on, Pirates. Gina <laughs> and Davis. it's got action. Yeah. And Gina Davis is kicking uh-huh. ass in it, too. Yeah, she's great. So I remember uh, that. I haven't seen it in a long time, but I yeah, liked it. I liked it, too. 
Mm-hmm. And I like to go back to that every once in a while for the fact it's like, come on. It's like we had Pirates of the Caribbean, we had Johnny Depp, but let's mm-hmm. see somebody else kick a little ass. Mm-hmm. You know, and then let it be a lady. I think my dad really likes that too. He watches it when it comes on. <laughs> All right. So with that, we're uh we're gonna ask you where listeners could hear you now. I recently finished podcasting on season four of Handmaid's Tale, and that was on House Podcastica, Handmaid's Tale edition. Mm -hmm. It was a great experience. Season four was spectacular, the best in my opinion. Really enjoyed that. And I will definitely be back to do season five. We don't know when that will be. There were two years between season three and four, so who knows? And I was also recently a guest on our friend Ben Beck's new podcast called Wilhelm, and we discussed all mafia and gangster movies. That was a lot of fun. I have to, that's on next on my queue, and I have to sit in the car and listen to that as I'm on my way to and from work. (laughs) We talked about another guilty pleasure movie that I kind of had forgotten about completely until I did that podcast, and that was Married to the Mob, also with Matthew Modine. Really? Yeah, that was really good. It was, um, uh, um, Michelle Pfeiffer and Dean Stockton. Stockwell or Stockton? Stockwell, Stockwell yeah. Okay. It was hilarious, yeah. Yeah, and kind of those humor movies that I like about the mob, like Johnny Dangerously, I really enjoyed those films, mm-hmm. too, as a kid. This was definitely all comedy in camp, but you, it, it so well. It worked so well. Did you guys mention the Stallone movie? Yes. Okay. And cool. did. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's I had forgotten movie. about that completely as well. Yeah. 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 It's one of those movies I like to watch every once it's in a while. It's funny too. because you don't think there's that many. And then when you start adding it up, there's a ton of mafia movies out there. Well, there was the old early one. I forget what it was. It had Scott Bayo in it when he was a kid. Oh, my gosh. Well, I, I forgot the name one. of it, but yeah, yeah, I, I'm sure we could. I could always like clue it in and say, "Hey, Ben, you forgot this movie." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we have quite a few honorable mentions. Yeah, but it, there's only so many that you can mention. I understand yep. that completely, and uh, as long as you got the ones that uh, that you both love that are out there, yep. and then it clues people in. You know, just like mm-hmm. what I like to do with guilty pleasure movies. You know, honorable mentions is very much very similar, but a lot of people are not privy to that information yep and a lot of things are getting lost because you can't stream everything so you got to go search for it so it's pretty cool that's why i do these guilty pleasure things i think that's why ben does his honorable mentions because he wants to be you to be enlightened with a lot mm-hmm. more content that's out there that's available i came out of that with like four movies i need to watch exactly. that i've never seen yeah yeah, yeah. so now you got to go hunt them down yeah <laughs> All right. Well, with me, you could hear me on Panels to Pixels, and that could be found on the Next Level Network, which Ben is on as well with Wilhelm and a select few. Well, he, he's, he does this Celebrity Spotlight, Wilhelm, and you could actually check out a bunch of the other podcasts that we have on the network as well. So I highly recommend that. So I do Panels to Pixels. That's Anything comic book adapted to TV, film, or anime, or cartoon. And I do that with my co-host, Steve Brown. And we finished up Loki. We covered Black Widow. And we're moving right into What If and uh, on Disney+. Plus. So check that out if you can. And that is Panels to Pixels podcast. And that's on the Next Level Network. So check that out if you can. And for those of you that would like to submit any kind of feedback, you could just submit your theories or feedback to our Facebook group, which would be facebook.com slash Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. And with that, if you don't want to send anything there, you could also send us an email. And you could just email us at adrenalinecinemapodcast at gmail.com. And what I like to tell everybody, because you're listening to us on a podcast player of choice right now, We could be heard on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, TuneIn, Deezer, or there's a multiple. I think we're on like at least a good 30 of them right now. So word of mouth is very important. So if you could tell a friend or just mention it to them, tell one or two people, that would be great. And if there's any rating or review within those platforms, if you guys could actually do that, that would be awesome as well. And to clue you into what's going on with the future of Pyrocore Entertainment and that family. 
Well, we are looking for content creators. So if you or a friend are a content creator, whether it be podcasting, video content, or if you're just an artist that has an Instagram, Twitter, anything, or you have your own website that you would like to exploit and get people to click on to. We at Pyrocore Entertainment just want to encourage everybody to send some sort of uh, content that they're they're doing and submit it to us at pyrocoreentertainment at gmail.com. We'll take it into consideration and we'll get back to you. And then, you know, if you want to be part of this family, we would love for you to be on it. Well, the only thing that is required to be on it, honestly, all it is is just recommending all the other content that you appreciate within the actual Pyrocore Entertainment Network. And that's it. There's, there's no money. There's no uh, payment required. It's just us becoming a bunch of content creators coming together and supporting one another. And that's really what benefits us. So That's great. Yeah. So with that, I just want to thank all of y'all listening right now. And I want to thank Wendy for being on. Anytime. Thanks and, for having me. Oh, thank you for being on and, and suggesting this. So... I just want to say thank you, everybody, for listening to Adrenaline Cinema. I'm Mark. I'm Wendy. And we'll talk to you guys later.